Hi, uh, I'm Lukas. I studied digital media uh, in Darmstadt and now I'm studying technical director at the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg and right now I'm in my diploma semester. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, I studied media computer science near Frankfurt before coming um, to Film Academy and I'm also in my diploma semester. And today we're going to talk about Scarif, which is not just this beautiful planet from Star Wars which got blown up and stored the uh, um, data for the Dev Star, but also pipeline data. So, uh, what we want to talk about is quickly uh, how we see the pipeline problem. Then we'll show you our first approach to it and um, what we learned from that. And then we will t show you the actual Scarif pipeline tools and the concept of them. And afterwards, we quickly go over the current development process of the pipeline. So how we define for us the pipeline problem is um, how can many people from different departments with uh, diverse requirements and a variety of tool sets, unique workflows and structures all contribute efficiently, sustainably over a long time to multiple projects. So that's quite a big task to tackle. Um, yeah, but we try, we try to solve it. So uh, in our first semester, we came up with our first approach for it, which was a quick prototype for the FMX and ITFS trailer in 2016 um, for the trailer production there. And the pipeline was purely based on name, naming conventions. We supported Maya New Kudini, and we centered everything about a unified asset pipeline. So we had like Saver Loader, a scene assembly, and some small previewing and publishing tools. And it was so far used in six production. So for the small scale production, it was fine, but there were still uh, a couple of unsolved issues, which were, for example, large scale productions. If you render a shot, it was not really e easy to figure out, okay, which assets from which version in which state do we actually use in here, especially with all the dependencies they come with it. The structure was quite rigid, so we provided an exact template of how the project needs to be structured and the user could not really redefine it. The production itself was centralized, so all the assets and the pipeline scripts were all on one server space. So if we wanted to do some modifications to the pipeline, it was all live, so quite risky. Um, the tool themselves, they were not really extendable because it's just like a three weeks prototype, so there was no time to make it nice. And it was Windows only. So we fixed most of that if not all of that. In our second approach with this Scarif, and uh, we improved in lots of the features there. So we tried to focus on making it very flexible for the workflows and also the structures so that the, the user can define some workflows the project demands. Um, we have focused on asset dependency tracking. So if a rendering goes out, we can track without opening any software exactly, okay, it was using those assets, those caches, those versions, these textures, and so on. Um, it's easily extendable. So the software packages are delivered in different um, ex uh, extensions. So you can, for example, we have Maya and Houdini as different extensions. And if someone, for example, wants maybe some Unity or After Effects or whatever, they can develop it as an extension and just plug it to the system. Um, some advantages re um, compared to maybe some other tools from our, as we may see it, um, is that it's very artist friendly in setup and maintenance. So everything comes with the UI. Nobody has to uh, hack in some, some values in some config file. Um, it's very flexible without any complexity. So for example, if you need to set up some user envi some, some environment for software for your DCC application, some, some paths and so plugin paths and so on. You can do this all through the UI and manage all your different software versions and configs. Um, the design itself is quite modular for a TD, so he does not have to touch the core of the pipeline code, but he can extend it and use some of the core functionality. Um, it's a decentralized production, so we can have um, the asset, is, uh, the, the pipeline itself is installed per machine and the assets can lie on different servers. And it's a cross-platform solution, so Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, maybe a quick overview of this pipeline itself and some of the, the features. Um, so we support Maya, Houdini, Nuke, and Unity. Um, the core functionality is, of course, file management, scene assembly, 
as everyone knows, like previewing and rendering is always important, versioning and also having variations, not only the versions, uh, the dependencies and a good uh, review structure or pipeline. And the backbone of it all is our uh, MySQL database. Maybe some words for the asset management workflow. So the uh, major lifting is done in work files and these files then publish data for the next department. This data contains an asset node, which makes it uniquely identifying. Um, the published data is available for all the other departments, and this process of publishing the data can be highly customized. So, for example, rigging departments may demand some different actions before and after the publish than maybe a modeling department, and this might also vary on projects. Um, and the whole process is naming convention independent as everything is done using our database. So why do we need some sort of asset node? It enables us to track down one asset through the whole production pipeline. It makes it easy for us to automate asset assembly from different tasks. For example, we have a big creature. This has maybe some shading, some, some animation cache, maybe some FX cache, and this needs to become the lighting, and lighting does not want to manually assemble all the different types of published data, but it can be automated using the asset node. And this node gets automatically created in the process for the artist. It exists in the, in the published files as a node. And for example, in some other uh, data formats like Alembic, it's just a simple transform node with containing the data we need. So I need the microphone. <laughs> there you go. Do you want to stand here? Sure. Perfect. It's just this thing somewhere. Okay, so thanks Lucas. Um, I will be talking a bit about the uh, uh, framework behind it. So one of the main features we support is uh, decentralized production. So what you have a lot is the common problem that when multiple team members um, work together, they might work in different places. One is working from home, even at Film Academy, people go home. and. Um, Artists should not worry about file management at all. So um, the assets um, are copied between locations mostly automatically um, in the ideal case. And you can also have um, some of your stuff locally until you publish it. Then it needs to go to the server for rendering. Um, about the code structure. So the first thing was very uh, roughly done. It was quite rigid, as Lucas said. and um, with this one, we tried to make it as modular and extendable as possible. For this, we use a, a PyPy server, um, which is hosted at Film Academy, and um, it's distributing all our Python packages, so everything uh, is quite in, in a tiny package um, and installed uh, to a Python virtual environment, which is set up per project. Um, the main package would be the hub. The hub is basically the entry point for everything you do in Scarif. It always runs in your taskbar and you can launch applications from it, set up stuff, manage stuff. Then there are apps, which could be, let's say, a user manager or just an arbitrary publishing tool. They mostly use um, the core and the database module, but you can also have extensions which tap into um, DCC applications. Uh, using host functionality and um, you can very easily um, provide stuff like additional file types um, which might be used in some application or uh, new nodes. As I said this makes it very flexible so the hub is completely project independent and always runs in your taskbar and if you need to uh, you can have different versions of different tools uh, in each project because it's uh, everything is sandboxed and so um, you can have not only different versions, but artists can have different versions locally because everything is installed on the machine, unlike the old approach, which was quite naive. Um, and you can also integrate scripts uh, quite easily that way. Another cool feature um, we wanted to have was a unified um, Python API at least on a very basic level. So you have stuff that you do all the time in DCC applications like load me the file, reference me the file, rename that node. And it's, you write the tool, you write the tool for Houdini, you write the tool for Maya. So you should only write it once and then have a layer that basically translate that action into the actual 
command that the tool needs. So we have that now, um, and it makes the code, um, let's say, more readable <laughs> and also uh, more portable to different applications um, if we chose to um, add a new one. Um, on the artist side, um, as Lucas mentioned, we try to make everything quite visual and um, guided. So usually things are set up via TD, which is fine, but sometimes people like to um, do it themselves or they feel less of a hurdle if they can do it so. So we have everything mostly um, guided by UIs. Um, uh, this starts at like the database setup, which has um, guiding text, um, user management, asset locations, so basically where you store your stuff, um, app environments, you can add different applications, different environments to the applications, different variations of the application. And you can also uh, manage your packages locally. So for example, if you need a different package on your machine, you can install it by just the click of a button. And currently, this pipeline is used in two productions, which is Evangeline, this uh, eight-minute uh, full CG movie, and Fuzzle, which is a four-minute full CG movie, and they're both coming out next year in March. So what are we currently doing, or what is in deployment already? So of the major tools that we currently use, so there is a working Maya pipeline with all the, the stuff you need and love, like save, load, and publish, you know the things. Um, also referencing, uh, there is a texture footage library, and we recently completed a sync between our own database and F-Track for the producers in our team. So they can assign tasks in the interface they're used to and also manage producing stuff. Um, upcoming features and what we plan for the future. So we just started on the Houdini integration and um, Nuke as well will be coming. Uh, for both projects, they are needed. And um, we also had requests for an RV review pipeline as well as um, Unreal and Unity, which is a, a field we are interested in. And um, we're also very interested in adopting some of the new industry standards. For example, the new hot kit in town would be USD. And then there is Open Timeline IO for the guys who don't know it. That is um, also a Pixar thing. Uh, you can use it to get your editing data from Final Cut or what is it, Avid, uh, back into in your CG pipeline. So you have an interchange there. And um, we plan, if everything goes according to plan, to release it uh, open source at FMX next year. Yeah. So thank you for your attention. thing I would like to add to this wonderful presentation it's, uh, it's we have seen a lot of pipeline projects at Film Academy. We also had a pipeline once years ago. Uh, and <laughs> so, but what's a bit uncommon and what's very fortunate with the Scarif pipeline is that it has already been used in quite a lot of projects and that these guys are also preparing to hand it over to somebody else for the time when they leave to continue working with <laughs> 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 um, uh, So that's, quite, that's a big no in terms of Film Academy because sometimes people create great pipeline tools and then they leave and then even though the code and documentation is there but they get abandoned and, and this one has pretty good potential to, to be continued uh, in the development. So congratulations <laughs> on that part. Or maybe there's other questions, please don't don't be shy. Have you ever tried it out on bigger productions than four minute or eight minute short movies? With oh. many vendors and many assets to share and stuff? Um, right now, I no. don't think we have <laughs> at the RE oh, at the Animation Institute. It's like eight minutes is like the m biggest project we have right now, I think. Yeah, so no. There's many smart ideas yeah. and it would be wonderful if it, if it would be working together with what they presented, you know, we all have the best proof of ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe in the future, but. It's also, yeah. <laughs> for now, it's proprietary <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 
I, I can maybe quickly explain that he mentions that it, it, it's proprietary, but the reason for that is that we have a regulation where the TV developments at Film Academy need to go through a review process in terms of what libraries are used mm -hmm. and what suitable um, license to put it out into the open source. Because in the end, it could mean that Film Academy gets on, on very unstable ground if you use the wrong libraries. That's the reason why it's not out there yet. But our goal is to help them bring it out and make it solid. So you know, you can expect this to be open source at FMX 2017. Unless you guys use some, some sort of <laughs> weird license that you have to talk about. 2019. That would, that would be a tough deadline. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. There's another FMX this year, haven't you heard? FMX 4 edition. 2019. But I, basically, it was your idea that people would pick up that development from other areas and maybe. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully. So, potentially, why not? All right. Oh. What was the name? Did you encounter any problems? I don't. <laughs> not yet, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe after the slide. <laughs> it's a very. Any effort into your uh, corporate design? Maybe you should think about this a bit. <laughs> I guess it's very it's a very minor planet which is even destroyed so uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah. 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 We will see about that. Public domain of the APUs or how much it's key. All right. Thank you very much.